So this joint work with Ato Chumai and Pan Peng. Um, let me start with a few examples of very large networks. We all know things like social networks, like Facebook, Google Plus, and so on. The World Wide Web, um, or co-citation graphs, where in co-citation graphs, the nodes of the graph are papers, and two papers are connected if they are cited by a third paper. Or co-authorships of uh, co-authorship graphs, where the nodes are authors, and like there's a link between two authors if they are co-author of, uh, of the same paper. And um, all these uh, networks can be quite big, so data sizes can be in the range of gigabyte up to terabyte. And if you have additional data, like in social networks, then it, I mean, then you have like movies, images, and so on. This can be easily in the petabyte range. And um, I'm interested in, uh, in information which you can obtain from the link structure of these networks. And uh, for example, in a social network, an edge corresponds to a friendship link between two persons. And if you now think, what is a well-connected subgraph, then this, is, uh, this is corresponds to a social group. Um, if you think about co-citation graphs, the, pa uh, the, the nodes are, um, are papers, and I have an edge if they are cited by a third paper, which means that most likely these two papers deal with a similar subject because they are cited by another paper. And so in this case, a well-connected subgraph is something like a paper in a scientific, or a set of papers in a scientific area. And in co-author graphs, well, an edge corresponds to two people who have been working together. So a well-connected subgraph is something like a scientific community. And so we can ask, like, how can we extract this information from graphs? And uh, one way to do this is to try to identify these groups of well-connected people or well-connected uh, vertices in the graph. And this is typically called, um, or these, these well-connected subgraphs are typically called clusters. And like in our case, we also have the additional uh, constraint that our input graphs are quite large. So for example, if you want to like compute clusters of the web graph, then clearly the size of the graph is already a big challenge. And um, so we can try to use classical algorithms, which require at least linear running time. But today, I really uh, want to do something faster. I want to use some sort of random sampling process to uh, identify uh, if a graph has a cluster structure. So I don't really want to compute the clusters, but I just want to tell if the graph consists of some clusters or not. Um, in fact, I don't really want to do this decision problem. But I just want to decide between the case where I have a cluster structure, and on the other hand, uh, there's the case that I'm really far away from a cluster structure. So I have to modify the graph in many places to obtain a cluster structure. And so that's the, the problem I would like to solve. And if the graph has a cluster structure, then I would, in addition, like to get representatives of each cluster. So. Um, or at least of each suffi sufficiently big cluster, so that I know at least what, what's the cluster about. And um, I want to do this using some sort of random sampling in time sublinear in the input size. So that's my goal. And now, um, since I want to talk about sampling processes, like in the first place, I need to uh, define how uh, how I access the, uh, <coughs> the input graph. And here I will assume essentially that my graph is given as adjacency lists. So I have an array of vertices numbered from 1 to n. And for each vertex, I have a list of its neighbors. And additionally, I'm assuming that my graph has also a bounded maximum degree, which is something which is debatable in practical settings. But um, I think for, for many of these networks, it's sort of OK to assume that I, I have a constant number of neighbors, like I only have a constant number of friends in Facebook and so on. 
And um, yeah, so a bit more formally, the, the assumption is that I have an oracle which I can ask for the ice edge incident to vertex j in constant time. And um, I want to study this, the, the question of testing the cluster structure in the framework of property testing, which was introduced by Rubinfeld and Sudan, and later for graphs by Goldreich, Goldwasser, and Ron. And property testing is a formal framework uh, to study sampling processes for very large networks. And here I'm using this bounded degree graph model, which was introduced by Goldreich and Ron. Okay, so before I can completely formalize my problem, I need uh, uh, a bit more notion to, uh, to describe what I really mean by cluster structure. And um, I will define my clusters in terms of something which is called the conductance. And uh, so essentially conductance is like a measure for connectivity of, uh, of uh, sets or of graphs. And uh, we have that the conductance of a cut between a set C and the rest of the graph is the number of edges that cross this cut divided by the size of C and normalized by the maximum degree. And the conductance of a graph is just the, the uh, conductance of the cut in the graph with the smallest conductance. <clears throat> and now I say that a subset C is a phi in, phi out cluster if the conductance of the subgraph induced uh, by the set C is uh, at least phi in. So inside the cluster, I'm very well connected. And the cut of the cluster to the outside is at most phi out. And you should think of phi in as being much bigger than phi out. So inside my cluster is very well connected and I have a smaller cut to the rest of the graph. And if I can partition my vertices into at most k phi in, phi out clusters, then I say I have a phi in, uh, k phi in, phi out clustering. So, so my objective is now to design a sampling algorithm that on the one hand accepts with a constant probability if the input graph is a k phi in phi out clustering and it rejects with probability at least two third if my input graph differs significantly from such a clustering or a bit more detailed if it differs from every k phi in star phi out star clustering in more than epsilon d n edges. And here you should think of phi in star and phi out star as being something which I want to have close, uh, I want it to be close to phi in and phi out, but I need some gap there. And I don't really want to go into much more detail because uh, there, are a lot, there, there are a number of parameters that show up in these gaps and then things are getting messy. But still, we are, we are quite, close, uh, uh, quite close here. So this, this is the decision problem I would like to solve by random sampling. And like this probability to third here, that's nothing special. You can easily amplify it to any, uh, high, uh, any bigger constant you like. And um, of course, I want to be as fast as possible, so uh, the number of samples and the running time I am, um, I'm using should be as small as possible. So I want to be uh, as fast as possible. And I want to avoid reading the whole graph. So I want to do this really uh, by uh, some clever sampling process. And the sampling process I'm going to use is a random walk. So let me quickly uh, repeat what a random walk is. It's a uh, it's a randomized process where I'm starting at some vertex and then I'm choosing one of its neighbors uniformly at random and then I'm moving to this neighbor and then I repeat this process a few times. And um, it's known that like if my graph satisfies some 
basic properties, namely it's connected and not bipartite, then this random walk converges to a unique stationary distribution. So I know that in the end, essentially the probability to be at the vertex is just proportional to the degree of the vertex. So that's a basic random walk. And uh, that's not exactly what we are using. We are using something called a lazy random walk, which is kind of uh, the same thing. The only difference is that I have some probability to stay at the vertex as well. And um, I'm taking every edge with probability 1 over 2 times the maximum degree. And with the remaining probability, I stay at my vertex. And this modification just has the, uh, has the effect that in the end, my stationary distribution is uniform. So when I'm doing the random walk for sufficiently many steps, I will be at every vertex with the same probability. And now, an important, um, an important measure is the rate of convergence of a random walk. The so rate of convergence means, uh, or, well, it, is, it, it depends on the structure of the graph how quickly I'm reaching this uniform distribution. I know that I, independent of the graph, I know that when I'm doing the random walk for uh, sufficiently many steps, I will always reach the uniform distribution, but uh, like this, the, the speed, the rate of convergence depends on the structure and it can be expressed as in, in terms of the second largest eigenvalue of the transition matrix or, and that's what we are doing here in terms of the conductance of the graph. So essentially, well, if you have a small cut in the graph, let's say you have a click here and a click here and there's just one edge between them, then it takes a long time until I'm crossing this edge and until I'm reaching every vertex with the same probability. When I'm always having uh, relatively large cuts between all the sets, then this goes much faster. And it's known that like when I'm doing a random walk for constant times log n steps, where n is the size of the graph, um, then uh, I'm converging to the uniform distribution. If G is a, uh, is a one phi in phi out clustering for some constant phi in, or in other words, if G is an expander graph. So if I have just one cluster, uh, you can essentially ignore the phi out because like the, the cut to the outside is just uh, not existing. And so we are just talking about uh, the phi in, so just about the inner conductance of the graph. And so it's, if this is a constant, then this is a so-called expander graph. And then we know that uh, the random walk converges quickly. And yeah, this case of testing the expansion of the graph or this special case of a one phi in phi out clustering has been studied, uh, studied a lot in the past. Like it started with Goldreich and Ron um, who introduced an algorithm which is based on collision statistics of random walks. So what they said is essentially what you can try is you can start a random walk and then um, you, uh, you can count how many collisions are there among the endpoints of the random walk. So where collision just means that like two random walks are arriving at the same vertex. And like, um, uh, and they, they could not analyze this algorithm, but uh, essentially they gave the algorithm and conjectured that in something like root of n time, you can distinguish a phi expander, so one phi in phi out clustering, from a phi star expander, uh, or from a graph which differs in more than epsilon d and edges from a phi star expander. And um, Arthur Juma and I uh, gave a first proof of this with a somewhat bigger gap than in this conjecture um, between phi in and phi, uh, uh, between phi and phi star. And this was later on improved by uh, Nachmias Shapira and Kellen Sashadri. And also related to this, this paper by uh, Batu et al, who were testing the mixing time of Markov chains. And they were also using these uh, collision statistics to do this. <coughs> 
And okay, so I'm using this O star notation here um, also to just simplify the running time and uh, focus on the most important parameters. So uh, um, here there are, there are lots of other parameters appearing like epsilon and like the phi possibly and so on. And I'm just assuming all these parameters to be constant. I'm also ignoring logarithmic factors so that we can like focus on the, on the main thing. Yes? Exactly, yeah. So I'm just looking at the endpoints of the random walk. And then, yeah. Okay, so how does this algorithm look like? So here are a bit more details. I'm sampling one over epsilon edges, uh, one over epsilon vertices uniformly at random. So these are the start points for my random walks. And then I perform something like root of n lazy random walks of lengths roughly log n from each of the vertices. And then I'm just counting the collisions. And if the number of collisions is not very high, then I accept. And if I see too many collisions, then I reject. So for example, if you have a graph where you have some small set, or let's say we take this example of having two cliques or two very good expander graphs which are just connected by one edge. When I'm starting on one of the sides, then my random walk will likely to stay, will likely be staying on this side. So I see a lot more collisions like a, I don't know, factor two or maybe factor four, more collisions because essentially I'm just staying on this side. And uh, so like in expectation, I see too many collisions and um, I will detect in this way that this is not an expander graph. And um, so more generally, if the graph is an expander graph, then we know that our random walk quickly converges to the uniform distribution. And um, the uniform distribution just minimizes the number of collisions. So um, if we denote the number of collisions, uh, or if we use p of e to denote the distributions of the endpoints of the random walk, then the expected number of collisions is just the L2 norm of uh, p of e squared. And then, as I said, the uniform distribution minimizes this number of collisions. So essentially, in order to prove that the algorithm works, one has to prove that if my graph is uh, far away from an uh, expander graph from a one phi in phi out clustering, then this, uh, this uh, p of v squared has to be bigger. And that's something which is uh, yeah, where, where most of the work is, is happening. And I, I don't want to go into these details here. But essentially, one can prove that uh, in this case, this expected value is bigger. And then you just have to apply standard concentration bounds. OK, so that's the case of one cluster. Now let's try to go to more than one cluster. So here, the situation is a bit different. Like, if we are in a lucky situation, and we, we have, like in this case, two clusters which are very well connected, and we have only very, very few edges between the clusters, then what's going to happen is when I'm starting here and I increase the length of my random walk, then at some point my probability mass will essentially be spread uniform on this part. And then when I'm increasing the length of the random walk further, then the probability mass also moves to this other part here. And, uh, if I'm now taking the length of my random walk uh, to be in such a way that I'm at this first stage where my probability mass is essentially uniform here, but not much has moved to this side, then um, uh, yeah, essentially no matter where I'm starting here, I'm always getting this uniform distribution here. And also, like all the starting vertices here, 
should essentially have the same uh, distribution of endpoints of random walks. So in other words, when, when I'm starting in the same cluster and when I'm choosing the length of my random walk in, a, in the right way, then essentially the distribution should be, should be roughly the same and uh, it should be essentially the uniform distribution on this cluster. Um, and that's what, what we want to use. But there, there are some problems. So one, one of the problems is, um, like in the, in the previous example, essentially we were testing if the number of collisions is close to what we are expecting for the uniform distribution. And we could now try to do the same thing here and try to find out if we are essentially uniform on this part. But there's a very simple obstacle which uh, makes things uh, or makes this approach not work. We just don't know the size of this cluster. And that's, uh, that's surprising, but this is really a, a big problem because um, like they, they are, uh, so people have been considered to estimate the support size of a distribution. And like the size of this cluster essentially is the support of my distribution. And it's known that it's quite difficult to estimate the support size of a distribution. So you can't really do it in sublinear time. So there's not really, so we, we don't really have a hope to find out how many vertices are here. And that's why we have to do it a bit differently. And uh, that's why what, what we are doing is really, we are comparing uh, the distribution of the starting points to each other and not against the uniform distribution. It's a small difference, but that's, uh, that's important here. And the other obstacle which makes things hard is that we don't, uh, we, we don't really want to talk about the stationary distribution here. I mean, if the graph is a K-clustering, then still the stationary distribution is the uniform distribution. So we don't really learn about the cluster structure. So we have to choose the length of our random walks in a clever way so that we essentially, that we are essentially on this part of the cluster. And that makes the analysis, uh, analysis in this case more difficult. But still we can do something and the algorithm is essentially what I'm saying here. There are a few things which I left out, um, but they, they are not, uh, not very important to understand the, the main ideas. So essentially what we are doing is we are sampling a set of starting vertices uniformly at random. And for each starting vertex, now let us define P of E to be the distribution of the endpoints of the random walk uh, of lengths essentially log n starting at the vertex V. And now for each pair of starting vertices, I'm checking if the distribution of these endpoints are close. And if they are close, then I'm adding an edge to something I call a cluster graph, which is the graph on this starting set of vertices. And the edge is just uh, indicating that these two starting vertices are probably in the same cluster because uh, the random walks essentially uh, get the same distribution. And um, in the end, we are accepting if and only if this cluster graph is just a collection of at most k clicks. Because then like if, uh, then like all the vertices from the same cluster should be connected to each other and I don't have uh, connections across the clusters. Okay, so now one thing we need to observe is that we can sample from this distribution P of V by just doing a random walk in the graph. So we can sample elements from P of V. And uh, this allows us to use, oh sorry, I'm, I'm a bit too quick. Um, but this will in the end allow us to also do this comparison whether this P of V and P of U are close. Um, so essentially, technically, what we are proving is that um, if G is a K phi in phi out clustering, then we can pick the length of our random walk in such a way that for most vertices which come from the same cluster, the distance or the square distance between 
of V and P of U is at most 1 over 4n. And for most pairs that are from different clusters, it's bigger than 1 over n. And, uh, and we, we had some examples that one can also not really get a much bigger gap here. So one really has to, uh, one really has to calculate quite sharply here. Um, but that's like the technical condition. So like if two vertices come from the same cluster, then they are a bit closer than what we can have when points are from different clusters. Essentially, when points are from different clusters, you can still be quite close to 1 over n because you could just have the uniform distribution on one cluster and the uniform distribution on the other cluster. And if the clusters are essentially the same size, then this thing here will be a constant over n. <coughs> so we cannot hope to be much better here. But the consequence of this is that, well, still, um, if these things are true, then uh, all we need is to estimate the distance of these two distributions up to an error of, say, uh, 1 over 4n. And then we can just distinguish if we are, um, if we are bigger than 1 over 2n, then we think it's this case, and if we are smaller, then we think it's this case. So if we can, yeah, yeah, it's additive error. So if we can do this, then um, our clustering tester accepts any k phi in phi out clustering, and this can be done using previous work on testing uh, the distance of distributions. So either by Batu et al. or by Chan Diaco Nicolas Valiant and Valiant. So that's the case. Uh, that was the completeness case uh, for the soundness. Um, we are looking at an input where G differs uh, in more than epsilon d and edges from a K phi and star phi out star clustering, and in this case one can prove that um, one can partition the set of vertices into k plus 1 subsets of size uh, of roughly linear size, so something like n over k. Um, so I'm assuming k is constant, such that each of these sets has a small cut to the outside. So I don't really know something about the inner structure of these sets. They can be very good clusters, but they can also be very bad clusters in the inside. But I know that I have a small cut to the outside, and that's already enough because my sample points, if I'm taking my initial sample big enough, then I will hit all of these k plus 1 sets. And since there are these small cuts between the sets, um, the distance between the distributions of starting points from different sets will be big enough so that um, our algorithm will not will not think of these two points as coming from the same cluster, so there will be no edge in our cluster graph, and this means that, um, that our cluster graph cannot consist of k cliques. Yes? So the epsilon is an, is an input parameter, which you can set arbitrary, and which also goes like into running time and so on. And um, I just didn't specify it here. I'm thinking of epsilon as being a, a small constant. It doesn't depend on the graph. It doesn't depend on the graph, no. It's something you choose in, choose in the beginning. OK, so yeah, what we can prove in the end is that our algorithm accepts every k phi in phi out clustering with probability at least two thirds and rejects every graph that differs in more than epsilon dn edges from every k phi in star phi out star clustering. And here, um, the phi out. So there is some gap between phi in and phi out, which I gave here. So uh, phi out is something like epsilon to the 4, phi in squared over log n. And the phi in star is uh, essentially the same thing. And for the phi out star, it's kind of strange, but we don't really need bounds on the phi out star. Um, uh, that essentially comes from 
uh, so for the for the soundness case, it will be enough to look at this condition, and really the phi out star doesn't play a role. Um, the phi out star would play a role if one wants to strengthen these results, in particular if you are trying, uh, or if one is trying to remove the logs here, which would be nice, but um, currently we have no clue and we believe that really if, if you are able to do this, then you need a lot of new ideas because uh, most likely one, one needs to find, one needs to get a very good estimate of the density of the cuts between the two clusters to do this for some technical reasons and uh, um, we are not sure if this is possible at all. And the running time is uh, something like root of n, again I'm, I'm ignoring some dependencies here on the epsilons, phi ins and so on. And um, okay, so that's like what we can show uh, on the theory side. And I now want to present you a very few and very preliminary experiments which we did. And like the first thing is essentially the takeaway message from the theory part is that like we can compare distributions of endpoints of random walks to say something about the cluster structure of graphs. And now that's what we want to do, but um, there are some difficulties. One of them is like we have this parametrization where there's this phi in, phi out. Now if I give you the web graph, what is the phi in, phi out? I don't know. I mean, one can of course plug in different values, but like that's a bit, uh, that's a bit messy. So we kind of have to probably get rid, get rid of this. And then the other thing is that like if you look at the at the results here, like already, if you see the epsilon to the four here, then it's sort of clear that like for practical purposes, that's too big. Like if I have epsilon to be 5%, then I need a really big gap uh, uh, to have this here, but um, uh, I mean to, to have a cluster structure, but then um, that's probably something uh, which is more an artifact of what we can show theoretically uh, than of what's really uh, what's what's really the truth, and um, but when one has to get around of these things, so you well we cannot just plug in the the results here, and so what what we what we did is um, we we are sampling some vertices as the starting vertices for the random walks, and then essentially we are doing the same thing as the theoretical algorithm, we are putting an edge between every pair of vertices whose distributions are close. And the closeness parameter is really something which comes from the paper, so we are using something like 1 over uh, 4n. And, um, but then we are not really looking for cliques, but we are just looking for number of connected components. And what we are doing is we are increasing the length of the random walk and of course, the longer the random walk, the more likely it is that for two starting vertices we are seeing the same distributions of endpoints. And so, like, the number of these connected components should go down over time. And now we can look at this, uh, essentially at, at these, at, at graphs which, um, uh, which look at the length of the random walk compared to the number of connected components. Here these uh, graphs look a bit boring. Uh, the reason is that the model we've been using here to generate the graphs is stochastic block model, which means that we are, uh, we are identifying a number of partition and number of clusters. So in this case for the blue graph, we have four clusters and within these four clusters, the density of the edges inside the cluster is bigger, so the edges are all taken uniformly at random, but inside the cluster with a higher probability than across the clusters. So we are getting a very clear cluster structure in this case. And that's something you can immediately see in this graph. So in the blue case, we had four clusters in the partition, and you see as soon as the random walk gets a bit uh, uh, above 50 steps, we are pretty stable at these uh, um, 
at these four clusters, and then as the random walk at some point gets longer, we are getting to just one, uh, to just one cluster. So that's what you would expect, and the same thing essentially happens if we have three uh, or, um, or two clusters in the beginning. I should say that like these are really, uh, this is really just a result from one run, so there's nothing about variance and so on. It's a very preliminary thing, but uh, uh, I still uh, thought that it's interesting. And then we also did the same preliminary things for some other networks from this uh, Stanford Network Analysis Project. So one thing we wanted to look at are road networks because they, are, they, they shouldn't really have a cluster structure because they are planar graphs and planar graphs are not really well connected. So we would expect that like for road networks, things are looking quite different than say in social networks. And then we looked at networks with so-called ground, ground truth communities. That's what, um, that's like one of, the, one of the possible networks or subclass of networks in this project. Because at some point we were hoping that we could possibly check the ground truth communities, but most likely they are a bit too small for our case, so we are more looking at a large scale. And um, we looked at five networks, LiveJournal, that's a blogging community network with some friendship links, Orcut, that's a social network which was run by Google at some point, um, DBLP, I guess I don't need to explain this, uh, YouTube social network where people in YouTube can connect to each other, can uh, make friendship, link, uh, friendship links. And something uh, like the Amazon co-buying network, if you want to say so. So, uh, these are, so in this network, the vertices are, um, are goods, are things you can buy at Amazon. And um, two things are linked if they are frequently bought together. And um, so the network sizes are, they're not huge, but they, they are also not very small, right? So like the nodes are between 300,000 and 4 millions, and uh, edges between 900,000 and 117 millions. So I would say that if you want to do clustering on these things, then, I mean, I, I don't know if like, uh, if uh, uh, things like Metis can probably cluster this, but, um, at least you need to have really optimized code to do something, and even then I'm not sure. Um, and we, we just did experiments on a, on a normal computer, so it's, uh, I, I think, uh, I think it, things have some potential. Okay, so that's, uh, that's again a bit of a boring graph, which is the result for the road networks. Um, so for the road networks, essentially, we, we have 100 starting vertices and like essentially everything is here on 100 or 99. So yeah, we don't have, uh, even if we increase the length of the random walk until like 40,000, we don't really see the same distribution. That's not very surprising because these are planar graphs, but it looks uh, different from what you get from the other networks because here the plots look like this. And that's quite nice um, because, I mean, that's sort of what you expect for things like DBLP, where you could potentially uh, expect something like a nested cluster structure. Like, well, first of all, there are these, these big communities like theory and, and uh, databases and whatever, and then when you look at theory, you get smaller communities like, I don't know, approximation algorithm, randomized algorithm, and you can zo zoom in into further details. And so what you would expect is as the length of the random walk, you see fewer and fewer uh, connected components. Um, another thing which I find interesting and which we wanted to have a closer look at is um, if we can get more information from these uh, from these graphs here. I mean, in this case, like ORCAT and DBLP, which are 
certainly different networks than this Amazon co-buying network here. Uh, you see these two have a sort of a similar um, graph and this one is quite different so maybe we can even use this to to identify certain classes of social networks or so and that's something we want to look at in more detail in the future. Um, at least this ORCAT and DBLP they they are quite different in size and so on so there's not a I, I didn't see a simple parameter why why these two things should just look essentially the same. Again this is very preliminary uh, like these are just one, this comes just from one run and so on. Um, might also be interesting, interesting to look at these plateaus here. So there seems to be something more stable, but maybe that's just an artifact of, of just having one run and so on. We, we need to check this a bit, uh, a bit more carefully. But uh, yeah, to summarize, um, or to, to come to the conclusions we have right now, I mean, we can definitely use to uh, use our algorithm to distinguish between some classes of networks. It's clear like road networks, for example, look completely different than social networks. There's also some hope that we can distinguish between different classes of social networks. And um, what's maybe most interesting is like if we can uh, say more about like a nested structure of, of very big uh, social networks or web graph and so on. And uh, that's something we want to look into in the future. Okay, thanks. That's all I want to say. <clears throat>